What's up, squad? It's Brandon from the Bantu Sun. Thanks for joining today. I wanted to hop on and drop another Geopol 101 uh, course lesson that I think really takes the geopolitical reality and, and brings it to the real world and just some of the lessons that I pick up from watching how the world operates. And, and this lesson is going to be called Build Where You're At. So there's a famous story of Booker T. Washington talking to an African-American group about economic development. And the story Booker T. Washington uses is the story of a, a, a man stranded out to sea. And this man, while stranded out to sea, he eventually comes upon another ship that he can see off in the distance. And so this man being stranded start screaming out for help. He's like, help, help. I need water. I need water. Help, help. And he can hear the other ship screaming back, but it's too far away. And, and as the other ship starts to get closer, the, the words that they're saying on the other ship become more clear. And the man stranded out the seas continue to plead and scream and beg, I need help. I need water. I need water. And finally, he can hear what the other ship uh, crew is telling him. They're saying, cast down your bucket. And basically what they were saying is, cast down your bucket into the water around him. See, although the man was stranded out to sea in the salt water, his, his ship, his boat had sailed into an inland riverbed. And it was fresh water all around them. And what Booker T. Washington was trying to convey in his story was the necessity of developing wherever you are at, not waiting for the perfect time or opportunity, but using your energy to develop your skills and industry of where you're at. And that's what's going to make you successful, not the ideal situation, but your tenacity and your ingenuity and your ability to utilize the environment which you are in. All the man had to do, he thought he was stranded. He thought he was out there with no access to, to any resources, to water. And this whole time, he was shifting and selling in fresh water. So why did I bring that story up? Because it reminded me of, uh, I was just reading about Iran the other day. So I'm always looking for things that don't make sense. And... One of the things that I always found was interesting was the, the conflict in Yemen and how Iran has been able to persist uh, throughout its regional conflicts, and especially in Yemen, which is next to Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia is, is one of the wealthiest per capita countries in the world, immense oil wealth, etc. And here you have Yemen right next to it. And in Saudi Arabia, with all this advanced weaponry, its top U.S. defense goods was unable to really come in and save the day in Yemen. And they ended up having to basically seek negotiation. And here you have the key backers of the, the opposing force of Saudi Arabia, the Houthis in Yemen. They're being backed by the Persians. And the Iranians are, are you know, it's a sea apart. It's, it's no neighborhood, so Yemen, of course, does not neighbor Iran. Like, how is the supply and logistics and the weapons standing up to Saudi Arabia, which is supposed to be a premier power? And, of course, it's some degree of Saudi Arabia is not built for function. It's, it's built for, I don't know, it's, it's just a show car to me. You know, it's like a show dog. It's not necessarily a working dog. It's not built. It's, it's, it's there. You know, they got fancy technology beautiful um, weaponry, the jets, everything top of the line, expensive. But I read trying to survive the U.S. sanctions and the, the region, the, the, the craziness of the region has evolved themselves to survive through their functionality. They do things that work because that's the only way they could survive is because things have to work. They don't do it for show. They don't do it to impress people. They do it to survive. So, the reason why I say this is one of the stories I came around was a very analytical look into how Iran cast down their buckets where they were at. Of course, they're besieged by U.S. sanctions and their region has been caught up in immense conflict. And Iran has taken this disadvantage and made it into a sort of advantage. 
And the reason and how they were able to do this is because if you look at their neighbors, if you look at their neighborhood, who's in their neighborhood, right? First, let's look at Iran. So Iran um, is a massive population, tens and tens of millions of people. I want to put around like 80, 90 million people. And they're highly mounted. So it's hard to invade. You really, it's a commitment. It's not an easy war. It's not as flat as, say, Iraq. On top of that, um, the country is a significant size. And even in Iran, Iraq war, the Iranians really rose to the occasion, became very fanatical about the defense. The stories of young Iranians running and jumping on mines and bombs for the rest of their company to pass to ward off Saddam Hussein invasion uh, during the Iran-Iraq wars, which is in uh, the 1970s, I believe. Nevertheless, so obviously invading Iran, you're going to have to think twice about doing that. Anybody that did want to do something of, of that nature. So they have a very strong defense. And in their neighborhood, though, their neighboring countries aren't as uh, fortunate and they've had a lot of issues, of course, the American war in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as contributions made in Syria with the Syrian civil war, as well as the West was heavily involved in, in that. But what Iran has done has kind of made lemons into lemonade, because what they'll do is they have built relationships with these countries, and they have got the access to go in and procure weapons that are left on the battlefield. I read a story of drones colliding each other and landing, and they were able to get a hold of those drones. And what they've been doing, because of all of this real-time war activity, is they've been going into these neighboring countries, your Iraq, your Syria, your Afghanistan, gathering the weapons of these more technologically advanced countries, bringing them back home, and reverse engineering them. And as far as industry, I think Iran is probably one of the one of the black, most blessed countries geographically as far as resources. I don't think it's not that many resources Iran probably don't have indigenously that it needs a lot of heavy industry metals, uh, coal, cheap energy. They have oil, of course. So they have a lot of, of industry around them. They have a great cultural reach as well. So they have soft culture, which is where they, they need a lot of their relationships. But Iran has developed uh, pretty much a defense industry, a very functional defense industry on a budget. And the article was, was going into detail of how missiles and rockets that would take uh, millions and millions of dollars for Americans or Russians or the Chinese to produce cost the Iranians tens of thousands of dollars, which allowed them significant scale. And as you can see, as Russia is in this war with Ukraine, what are they finding? They're finding Shahid drones. And they're saying a lot of these drones and some of these weapons that uh, Iran is pushing out is nearly identical carbon copies of their Western counterparts. And it's because it's obviously Iran has been reverse engineering these Western weapons. So I, I really thought it was an interesting story about building where you're at. They took that conflict zone and they said, okay, this is really bad. But like, what do they do? They evolve to the situation. And this is what really, I think, makes a lot of successful people, that ability to evolve. You have to be um, flexible and adaptable to the environment, which is a, a the skill set which allows people to flourish. Because so I'll give you a, a real life example now. I was just talking to a friend. And he's in the mortgage industry, and he's talking about the the housing industry, how tough it is right now because the interest rates are going up. So a lot of people don't want to leave their lower interest rates that they re received a few years ago after record low interest rates over, over the last decade plus since the, the great financial crisis. And people don't want to lose those interest rates for one, um, causing uh, house builders to have a basically a supply shortage to make sure that the demand, that they don't want to, they don't want to flood the market with a supply. They want to match the supply to the demand. And he's talking to his clients and one of his clients almost passed up on a great opportunity because they could afford the house. It was what they were looking for in the location they were looking for with the specs they wanted. But they thought they can beat the market and say, well, we'll buy again next year when the rates are lower. And he's telling them, like, what makes you think the rates are going to be lower? lower? Like, if anything, you probably can get an OK opportunity because the demand... The Everybody's sitting on the sidelines trying to outsmart the Fed Reserve like they know what's going to go on. 
And you really don't know. The future is uncertain in all cases. All you can do is be prudent and execute. But the future is uncertain. Will they raise be lower next year? It could be, but it could be not. So don't waste the opportunity today or burden in the hand, as they say, is better than two in the bush. And so he was trying to explain it. And that's the thing is because that person is so busy trying to be smart or think they have some inside information, et cetera, they're with the crowd because he said the entire industry is like that. Everybody's sitting on the sidelines. Like a lot of people are sitting on sidelines. Because of the shortages, values have gone up on houses. A lot of people have equity in their homes now because of the shortage. Um, the houses are priced high. The, the rates are high. So people are not getting able. They want to sit on the sideline for lower rates. And basically, it's, it's her mentality, her mentality, her mentality. And it's that ability to shift gears. Like that mentality works in a certain market, right? If but that mentality can work against you in other markets. This is why success is, can be challenging because a lot of it depends on your ability to adapt to the situation. But you got to build where you are. This is the macro environment and you have to figure out a business model that's going to work in this environment. I'll, I'll give you one more real life story. I was overseas in, in Australia and I knew I was going to travel back to the U.S. And I was like, OK, well, what can I do now to make my transition back? Uh, to the U.S. more favorable. And I was like, well, I can't really, don't want to tie my money up in too many things here, but I had a decent job at the time. So what I did was I saved, saved, saved. So that when I did get into America and it was a transition phase and I had no money incoming, it didn't matter because I already had a cache of cash that I could rely upon. So it's all about not letting the opportunity of the day um, be lost in hopes and in anticipation of an opportunity tomorrow. The world is always moving. Um, and a lot of that is you doing your own thing. You recognizing what you need to do and recognizing the opportunities it presents itself to you and not following the herd. Because a lot of the times when a herd is there, it saturates the market, um, increases the demand, which raises prices, which basically erodes the opportunity. So just being cognizant of that in, in your day to day, I think is so valuable. All the greats, all the greats, they develop strategies to win where they're at. They cast on their buckets and lo and behold, fresh water comes out. So thanks for joining me. I really appreciate your time. Let me know your thoughts, comments below. Like, share, subscribe if you enjoy the content. Until next time, take care. Bantu up.